Dr. Christopher McGowan, welcome to the American Glutton Podcast. Ethan, thanks so much for having me. I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to talk to you. So you are a weight loss doctor. That is your primary specialty. Is that right? It is. Yeah, I have. I'm in this. I'm in an ultra sub specialty, technically of gastroenterology. So it was kind of a winding path to get here. But I, I am a an obesity physician. I treat patients uh, who need help with obesity, and but with a in a very sub specialized way. So technically, I'm a gastroenterologist by training, um, and but now treat patients with these advanced endoscopic tools for weight. Okay, and a gastroenterologist like. As f I'm, I'm really, I, I, I don't, I'm not a medical guy, so I don't know that much, but you are the guy who checks the pipes, so to speak, and tells me if there's any problems in there. Is that right? Like if, if I have a, an ulcer, I would go to see you. Yeah. Yeah. Basically we're the plumbers of the medicine. Plumbers. Yeah. I appreciate that <laughs> analogy. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, I can walk you through a, a little bit of, of my background, and so I uh, so I am a gastroenterologist. That means I trained in internal medicine first, and then gastroenterology and hepatology. And what happened is I exited my training, and I was treating patients with digestive disorders, and it became really apparent that the root of most medical conditions is either directly or indirectly related to weight. I mean, I think that's well established. And what I kept running into in my practice is patients coming with various diseases or conditions or just symptoms. And, you know, we need to address weight, but I had nothing to offer. I mean, it's, it's embarrassing in medicine that probably in 12 years of training, I had like 35 minutes of directed obesity education. I mean, that's the nature of things. Wow. And so really didn't have many solutions to offer. And so I was left with what I was taught, which is Okay, so we, we need to uh, we need to lose some weight. How can we do this? Well, all right, eat less and move more. I mean, that's the most useless advice you can give anybody, and that's all we learned. And so at that point, I realized I need I need better training. So I at that point, I pursued obesity uh, obesity medicine certification, and simultaneously, this entire field of endoscopic weight loss procedures was coming online. And so it was a, a perfect timing for me to really shift my entire practice in that direction. This is amazing. You know, there's um my mind goes to a lot of stuff in the um the healthy at any size movement. There's often this complaint made about and like you know, there are aspects of that movement which I'm like, yeah, let's feel good about let's let's all feel good enough about ourselves to want to do something positive for ourselves. I think where it goes lopsided for me is when it becomes like, this is not an issue, you know, and, and I understand for an individual, it might not be an issue, but if we're looking at like the intention that society has for health or, you know, family and friends want a, a, not a lot of medical problems, then, you know, it is objectively an issue. It, it, it you know, f statistically an issue. Um, but one of their complaints is often they'll go see a doctor and the doctor's rec health recommendation for whatever they're suffering from is to lose weight. Now, that's true. Like that would increase their health. But like you're saying, like diet and exercise. I I lost weight through diet and exercise. It was a 20 year battle. And it's still kind of a battle. You know, the battle is less severe than it was 20 years ago. But I tried every diet. I lost hundreds of pounds and regained hundreds of pounds over and over and over again. And, you know, something clicked for me five or six years ago. And, uh, and I kind of understood it differently. But I can't take my understanding and plant it in somebody else's head. I can try to communicate about it. Um, I can say what worked for me, but simply saying diet and exercise, it's like useless advice. Like most adults understand that diet and exercise will produce physical changes. That doesn't mean anything though. You know what I mean? I understand that, uh, hard work will produce money. I don't have as much money as I'd like. Why am I just not working harder? You, you know what I mean? It's just like one of these stupid things. Yeah. It's completely stupid. And not only is it useless, it's 
basically insulting. And so, I mean, what are you telling someone? Yeah, just uh, diet and exercise. Who isn't aware of that? But, so the problem is that's not a useful piece of information. It's not useful advice. It's not productive. And so, uh, you know, for me as a physician, I need tools that are effective for the individual patient. And I think that's an important point because you, we have to approach each patient as an individual. For you, the path to where you've gotten is through diet and exercise. And it, it's, I know it's not been an easy process and it's taken time and you've learned a lot along the way, but maybe the next person needs a different tool and the next person needs a different tool. And that's really my job is to find the best path and tool and treatment for that individual. Yeah. And, 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 and when I say diet and exercise, it is really such a, a unfair, undishonest answer simply because like so much more went into it. Do you, do you know what I mean? But like, if somebody comes up and asks me, what did you do? It's not a lie. You know, diet and exercise is not a lie, but like, fuck man. I, I mean, I'm, I'm a recovering addict. It took me 15 years to actually think of my uh, relationship with food in a similar way that I thought of it, of my relationship with drugs and alcohol. And then food becomes so much more complicated because I can't, I can't be abstinent from food. So like, that's a lot of nuance that I'm not communicating by saying diet, diet and exercise. Do you, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Um, you can't possibly communicate it yeah, it's so succinctly. It's really right. complex. No, I mean, I'm writing a book right now. And like even that in 60,000 words, it's tough to communicate everything. Do you know what I mean? Like it's it's a lot that is, you know, like more like people want a tweet as an answer. They want 140 or however many characters you're allowed to write on Twitter now. 204 and and they want the secret and the trick that you did that solves everything. And it's like, that's not it. That's not what did it for me. And and by the way, if I tell you exactly what I eat, that's probably not going to do it for you either. You know what I mean? So true. Yeah. The secret is that there is no secret. And everyone's constantly looking for that secret. But it doesn't exist. But we do have tools. We do have processes that can work. Um, you've shown that. And so my general message to patients is one of positivity. You know, this is a really good time right now where if you need help with weight, if you're trying to lose weight or treat obesity, we actually have tools that work. And that's a, an important message for people to understand. Yeah, I think um, this gets really tricky, too, because within the, I don't know, the the diet area that whatever that is like you know this is something that people talk about all the time and i think that a lot of people will poo poo some of the tools that are available and other people will insist that their tools are the only tools that are the correct tools you know what i mean and so there's a lot of friction there i think one is that people need to believe in what they're doing and so if I'm going to become keto, I need to believe that keto is absolutely correct. And, and therefore I am going to try and proselytize all to become keto people because I need to be right in my assumption that this is correct for me. I need others to back that up. So that's a weird thing. And you could apply that to veganism other than moral reasons. I think that's a different thing. We're talking about weight loss, carnivore, paleo people all of these kind of schools of thought and then there's those groups which would take the other tools because all those diets i think of as tools it's just a tool and then you got like the bariatric surgery folks who as far as i can see um from looking at this the data those are the people who lose the most weight and keep it off the longest so like the fact that you would say to anyone who did that, that they're cheating or to knock it in that way. Do you know what I mean? It's a fucking tool, just like your diet is a tool. Um, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to swear. I don't know if I offended you with that. I do swear sometimes. I get very impassioned about this stuff. And now we have uh, we, we have medicines and peptides and stuff, which I want to talk to you about. I want to get your ideas on it. I am both simultaneously very hopeful and very scared about what these are going to do to society at large. 
Yeah. And that, there's a lot to talk about there. I mean, look, you can't get away from the story every day. It's been in the news for the past two years or so, all the talk about the GLP medications, mostly that's warranted. I mean, they are game changers as, as they were hailed when they arrived. It is true. We didn't have truly effective medications prior to them, and they really do work. Uh, the, there's some, it's complicated though. The right. initial messaging probably for the first year was that they were miracles, that they're cures for obesity. That is simply not true. And when you really get into it, it's much more complex. And the starting point is to understand that they're tools. I realize I'm, I'm using that word a lot, but it's true. These are tools and how we apply that tool is going to be important. Uh, you need to put the whole package together. And that is so, so important. So in our program, if a patient's starting a GLP medication like we go via or ZepBound, uh, we partner them with a dietitian and a health coach and they have a medical provider. Uh, and it's really comprehensive because we want to, of course, support weight loss, but we really want to make sure that that is long lasting, that once we reach a goal weight, we're maintaining. And often that part of the message is left out. You know, I, I've over the past year have, have um, the numerous, uh, you know, uh, interviews and commentaries around meds. And I can tell you that out of a hundred, probably, probably a hundred interviews, I mentioned that piece, like this needs to be a treatment that's comprehensive and it's always left out. Right. Never mentioned. Yeah. Uh, but it's probably the most important thing. So that's maybe one, one aspect that people need to understand. But when, when the medication is provided within this comprehensive framework, they're really effective. But the, the next thing is people need to really understand that these are long-term treatments and uh, they're not quick fixes. They certainly aren't cures, but they're effective long-term treatments. And so for that, they're really valuable. Now, they're not for everybody, but it's it's a major advance in the field. Yeah. See, I, I, I think if I had been, you know, if these had come out in 2000, I would be on them for sure. And, um, I mean, fuck, even if they'd come out in 2010 or something like that. But I do know for for 15 solid years, I would do a diet, lose weight, and then regain the weight. And sometimes it would come back slower than other times. I've now maintained this weight for five years. And I'm not going to lie, like it's a daily thing. It's it's not, you know, I kept waiting for the weight to go off and to and to like God to whisper in my ear, you're cured, my son. You know what I mean? Like that's and and that's not even really such an exaggeration. Maybe it wasn't in literal terms like that, but I was waiting for this change within me to happen from losing weight. It never, ever happened. And so I would do diets and the diets that produced weight loss the quickest, I would just repeat them and I would go like, well, it worked last time, but you know, my, my idea of work was just weight loss, right? I never had that, that maintaining part as a part of the factor. It was just like, well, if I can take off 30 pounds in 30 days on X, Y, or Z diet, I'm just going to do that again. Cause I know it works. I lost 30 pounds. And so my fear with and, and then, you know, and then I've been doing this podcast for a long time and, and I and one of the things I talk about more than anything is maintenance and, and how important it is to me simply because I didn't really think it through for a long time. And, you know, even close friends of mine w w stay on this cyclical pattern of losing weight really rapidly and gaining it back and in conversations with them. Uh, they all will say they want to maintain the weight loss, but they'll all go back to the quick fixes. Not, not a hundred percent of the time, but, but I see this quite a bit. Yeah. And I, and I realize like people are going to just do what they think is what they, what they're familiar with and what, you know, what is sold to them. And so along comes Ozempic and makes one of these crash diets. Sorry. I know you called it the other name, the weight loss name, Wagovi. Um, along comes Wagovi and it's like that crash diet that you're doing, it's now pain free. It now doesn't suck. You're not miserable every day. You're not, you're not, the food noise is turned off. Your hunger is down and it becomes easy. And for me, you know, in this pattern where it's like you're losing 
fat and lean tissue on these crash diets and then you're gaining back mostly fat and then you're doing it again and you're losing fat and lean tissue and gain the the actual body fat percentage is rising slowly over time when the weight is staying roughly the same as an average year to year and yep my fear is like for a lot of people that's going to happen without the kind of comprehensive care you're talking about that's the problem yeah and that is a legitimate concern you know you, i've heard you speak a lot about kind of embracing the process, not the goal. And that is a really big part of this. You know, the patients who, who really do the best long-term enjoy the process, learn to enjoy the process, whether they're taking a medication or had a procedure or, or at none of those, uh, it's really enjoying the process along the way and celebrating those small victories and all the non-scale victories that we, we, we love to celebrate rather than being fixated on the goal and then not knowing what to do once you get there and then regaining. But uh, it is true that with these medications, there is a, a, a significant risk of a weight recurrence or weight regain, especially when, that, when they're stopped. That's been well shown in clinical studies. We see that in routine patient care and practice. So if you're starting medicine, you have to plan to stay on it or the inevitable probably will occur despite all of your best efforts, best habits, uh, anything you do. The problem is your normal physiology is kicking back into action. So that's really a problem. And especially in over the past couple of years, the issues we've had with supply, with insurance coverage, with access to medications. So many patients have had the medicine pulled away from them, even out, outside of their control. So there's still a lot of unanswered questions about can patients really remain on these long term I mean, year after year after year? Is that feasible? Uh, can that occur across a wide population? That gets into the economics and value. It's it's really a complex issue. So when you're looking at people doing these, it is you're not thinking like, yeah, do it for three months. You're really thinking long term on the medication. You have to. And that's a really important conversation that I have with every patient right away. We have to establish the right framework because, look, someone comes in and says, I, I need help losing weight. I'm going to use this medication and I'm going to get everything in place. I'm, and then I'm just going to keep doing what I'm doing, but I'm going to stop that medicine because I don't want to use an injection every week for the rest of my life. And I understand that intention, but we have to look at this, the studies and the science. And I have to be really frank and direct that that's not likely to succeed. You know, maybe you can, maybe, you know, nothing's that definitive, but we have to be realistic that if you start this, you should plan to stay on it. And if your plan is not to stay on the medication, you really should not start it. Yeah, well, I mean, that's anything. I'm sure somebody did keto or Atkins or paleo. They just switched to that and it and that was enough of a change, right? And they lost their weight and they never looked back. And but I think when when we're having this conversation and it's just you and me talking, but the intention is to communicate to many people, the idea is like, okay, statistically. Keto is not really a life changer for that many people. It's not a long-term plan that, that, because if it was, we would see huge swaths of people who did it no longer overweight and living, you know what I mean? And, and you can find some, but you cannot find huge groups and you cannot find huge groups of that with any diet, really. That's right. Yeah. How many millions of dollars have been wasted on studies comparing this diet versus the next, keto versus intermittent fasting. The, the bottom line is there's no diet that's better than another. There may be a diet that works for a given individual, and I would always support that. I mean, if something works with you and your lifestyle and you're succeeding, fantastic. But if we look at large cohorts, large groups, there's no one diet that's better than another. They're all basically means of calorie reduction. Right. Yeah. I mean, and that's the that's the other one that that sneaks in. I lived in Los Angeles for most of my life, and the amount of times that I got just pushed off of some diet that was successful in order to, you know, because it was actually lectins that were making me fat or X, Y, or Z, you know, I, I, I was eating the wrong food for my blood type or, you know, you could, you could list all these diets where it was like, no, no, my goal was fat loss. 
And then I got sold that I had this other ailment that I didn't have that was actually causing me to gain, to gain fat. And so I'd go off on this other diet and it was like, no, you can eat whatever you want on this list of foods. And then I'm like, you know, I could drink olive oil for breakfast. You know what I mean? Like, I love fat. Like, that is my thing. I hear all these people who who like have a, a real issue with sugar. That was not my thing. I was not a dessert guy. I'd rather have another cheeseburger than have an ice cream sundae. Um, and I understand that that I'm not the norm. The norm seems to be people love to have the sundae, and that seems to be a gateway for a lot of people. Okay, wasn't my gateway. I'll have another cheeseburger or another slice of pizza or whatever. Um, but like the minute you open the doorway to fats for me, I'm overeating them. And so that's mm -hmm. not a, that's not a miracle fix for me. If, if, if unlimited fats are on any plan, I'm eating them unlimitedly and I'm not losing weight, you know? Um, but that is kind of taboo within the, the keto world. The keto world says that can't happen. And it's like, well, it happened, you know? Right. Yeah. You know, there's so much confusion, misinformation, mismessaging, um, you know, that carbs are evil, carbs cause weight gain, you know, most of these things simply aren't true. Uh, and so it's hard for people to, to understand what is true, what is a myth, what, is, what do I actually do? It's really a problem. Uh, and, and I always encourage folks who need help losing weight to seek out help from an expert. I mean, th there's this growing uh, body of obesity medicine specialized physicians out there. there. There is help available. Speak to an actual expert uh, so that you can get the proper advice that you need. Yeah. So, um, what is your, what is your position on processed foods? How do you feel about processed foods? So in general, in my practice, we have a general philosophy, which is there are no never foods because it's, it's really a generally a destructive approach. If you're eliminating complete food groups, complete categories, once you start overly restricting, that's problematic. I know you're quite familiar with that. And so in general, of course, it's better to eat whole foods, to stick with simple ingredients um, and, and less processed food. But if you want to have something processed sometimes, go ahead. It's totally fine. I, I think you have to be realistic about what can you do long term? What can you maintain? What's compatible with your lifestyle? And if it, you're going to have some processed things here and there, go ahead. It's totally yeah. fine. Yeah, no, I feel I feel the same way. I I do find that I am fuller, longer, and generally less hungry and irritable when my foods have one ingredient and it's like, that's the thing that I'm eating. So that's what I try to do, but I'm not, I'm not abstinent from processed foods either. I do, I, I you know, and, and, and I try to make m the processed foods I eat to be at least l lopsided towards protein. You know, if, if I can get a bag of chips that is protein heavy, carb and fat light, that's the thing I'm going to have. It's got 300 ingredients and I doubt that, you know, I'm going to be full for very long, but it could be fun to eat it. And then, you know, I got to watch out because that's the kind of thing that I'm not full for very long. So I might reach for another and another and another bag of chips and then feel kind of crummy. But I, right. I, I totally agree. That's all for me. Anecdotal. This is just my experience. I don't know what the, the science says, but, but, Again, we get into the universe where it's like it, people are demonizing and moralizing foods. And it's like, well, OK, if it works for somebody, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. That's exactly right. And you touched on something important there, which is protein first is a, a generally good philosophy. Uh, as long as you have protein incorporated with any meal or snack, you will feel more satisfied, more satiated. And that's a good approach. So if you want to have the simple carbs, at least have some protein with it uh, and you'll be better off. And that's a good general nutrition principle. But my patients work with registered dietitians because they're the experts and that's really important. So if you need that guidance, find a registered licensed dietitian that can be really helpful. Yeah. And do you do bariatric surgeries also in your practice? Yes. So within this endoscopic world, and we could talk for a long time about what, what that means, but just to distill it to its simplest description, most people are familiar with a gastric sleeve. It's the most common bariatric surgery. It involves cutting and stapling the stomach into a sleeve. It's a really effective treatment. 
but most people don't want surgery and that's understandable. They're concerned about, even though it's really safe, they're concerned about risks and downtime and all of these things. So the field that I'm in emerged to create effective treatments that are less invasive. So we're actually able to create a gastric sleeve endoscopically. What that means is we have endoscopic tools like flexible scopes that go down the mouth into the stomach and small stitching sewing devices. So we can actually stitch the inside of the stomach to make it into a smaller sleeve-like shape without ever cutting through the abdominal wall, without ever cutting the stomach. But the result is a greater sense of fullness with smaller portions. And so that is a tool that then supports that patient in the background, along with all of the other important components so that they aren't just fighting via willpower to eat less. And so it can be an effective tool for someone who's tried all of the other things, doesn't want to make the leap to traditional bariatric surgery, but still needs something that is going to be more effective in the long run. Okay. And now one of the things, because I've talked to a couple of people who had, uh, I, I don't know if they did exactly what you're talking about, but they had some form of bariatric surgery. And what they told me, which surprised me, was that they were, they had to, um, they had to diet prior to the surgery. And it wasn't a diet, you know, like they're too overweight for surgery. It was a diet to show that they were committed to some kind of life t lifestyle change. Is that, do you yeah. do stuff like that too? How terrible is that? No, I don't. I, I mean, don't. <laughs> I, I, I don't know. I mean, you're the guy. You tell me, is it terrible? Well, there are there are some insurance. A lot of this is actually dictated by insurance that, you know, this is a little bit of an antiquated approach, but essentially prove that you can lose weight before you'll have surgery. I mean, I think that's just a terrible message to send to a patient. It did um, seem odd to me, too. It's like, well, you're struggling so hard to lose weight. You're getting surgery, but you still have to lose weight like it. I was a little confused by that, too. Yeah, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Um, there's another aspect to it, just medically speaking, with a laparoscopic or a surgical procedure, a bypass or a surgical sleeve. The tools are um, entered through the abdominal wall. You need to get to the stomach. So there is actual reason for someone to fast for, say, two weeks ahead of that type of surgery. It, it leads the, the liver to shrink in size so that the stomach is more accessible. So that is a, a fact. Uh, in my field, we're doing everything endoscopically. It's actually irrelevant. So my patients do a day of liquids beforehand. I generally say, come in strong. Like, I don't I don't want you fasting and trying to lose weight ahead of time. You're going to lose that weight anyway. Let's come in strong and ready so you can recover and bounce back as quickly as possible. Okay. And then once the the actual stomach size is reduced... Are you are you encouraging protein heavy stuff and and any resistance training at all? Because I just uh, I just know one of my regrets from years of dieting the way I did, which was really rapid weight loss and then really rapid reaccumulation of weight, was that I I just fried a lot of lean tissue. I just I just yeah. did. I mean, even when I was doing keto, which I thought I'm eating so much meat, it's fine, but I was really eating so much fat. And I would go and get DEXA scans periodically and see 40% lean tissue loss and be bummed, you know? Yeah, we want to preserve every bit of lean mass that we can. It is so important. Whether you're having a procedure or not, if you're losing weight in any way, that should be the priority. That lean muscle is so valuable for anyone. So yes, you, this is exactly what we recommend. Now, if someone's had a weight loss procedure, they're typically on a liquid diet for a couple of weeks and that's all protein. That is protein shakes every day. We're, we're focusing only on that. But even as we transition along to regular food, it's always protein first every meal because the portions are generally smaller than what you're normally eating. And so we need to make sure that every patient has a minimum of at least 60 grams of protein a day. And for a man, uh, that's going to be higher. We might be at 90 or 100 or more grams per day just as a foundation. And then we're going to always encourage exercise one of the greatest myths in weight loss is that exercise is a weight loss mechanism. It's not. Um, you speak a lot about that. It is not, but it's really valuable when someone is losing weight to help preserve muscle. That is critically important. So as soon as possible, we want our patients to get active and then start adding in resistance or strength training if it's feasible. So we can hold on to that muscle and then take full advantage of that. Yeah. Again, anecdotally, my experience with exercise because I did spend like two years doing cardio with the explicit intention that I was doing it to lose weight. And I did lose weight. 
but like my anxiety about doing it was all out, out of the charts and I did so much that I was kind of uh, useless for anything else throughout the day. And then the minute I didn't do it, I gained weight. And so, yeah. and, and, and it also produced n numerous injuries that forced me to not do it. So it was like kind of this backwards thinking. And now I really think of exercises more for my mental health. Like I, I, I go to the gym and almost every time at some point while I'm at the gym, I wake up and I'm like, oh my God, I've been in a fog and now I feel better. You know what I mean? Like, that's why I go to the gym and like, I'm, you know, I, I, I just to be completely honest, I'm never happy with how I look. I just am not. And so I want this idea of retaining whatever lean mass I have. And so that's part of it, but it's got nothing to do. I'm not there thinking like I'm burning calories. You know, that's just not, I've, I've yeah. restructured my thinking around that because I think um, trying to exercise the weight off, I think that's a hopeless, hopeless pursuit. I really do. It, it, it is for the vast majority of people. The problem is that everyone has been sold this lie. Look, it's January. Everyone's signing up for at their local health club uh, because they're told that if you exercise, you will lose weight. And if you look at every study out there, it's not true. Uh, and this triggers some people, I know, uh, to be, but I'm not, you know, I don't deliver this message as, a, as to be pessimistic because there are so many valuable aspects. To, I mean, I exercise every morning, no matter what, every day, because of, frankly, for my mental health more than anything else. Of course, you feel better when you exercise, and it has all of these positive uh, health benefits uh, in terms of fitness, cardiovascular health. It's proven to reduce mortality long term. Your your mood's better. You sleep better. You know, all of these things are so important. But if you're exercising purely to lose weight, it's probably not going to work out. And the problem is that is it's depressing for people who are doing it, and it leads them to abandon that path, and they think it's a flaw with themselves and it's it's just not there are multiple reasons why exercise just isn't that effective for weight by itself yeah i i also i have the i have one other component which exercise and specifically cardio comes into play for me and that is i believe i broke my neat my my non-exercise active thermogenesis because i spent so many years so big where every calculation was about how exhausting something would be like I, I don't want to take my jacket off though I'm hot because it will it will use more energy. I'll actually start sweating from that movement. So I'm just going to sit here and be hot. I don't want to walk to the bathroom because I have to step up one step and that's hard at 500 pounds. And so I'm going to wait until, you know, I re I have to go so bad I can't wait. And so I practiced conserving energy so much that today, and I don't know, this could all be total bs but this is how i've wrapped my head around it today i have to force myself to move more and so i don't think of it as you know i don't really think of it as exercise i just think of it like if if i'm left alone i'll get 200 steps today and i want to get more than 200 steps and if that means i have to get on an elliptical machine or take my dog on a walk when i don't really feel like it then i have to do that but I'm not in there doing that thinking I'm losing weight. I'm in there thinking there should be some baseline of movement and I'm not hitting it. Right. Well, a lot of this gets to the, the root of uh, a problematic myth as well, which is calories in, calories out. And there's this tendency to just calculate and look at your Apple Watch and think, oh, I burned this many calories exercising and you're doing the simple math. And that's never going to work because weight loss isn't simple arithmetic. Um, and so that is problematic for most people. But you did touch on something important, which is that NEAT or the non-exercise activity thermogenesis, which a lot of people don't think about. It's more important and it's a bigger proportion of your daily energy expenditure. So the exercise is important for your health and your well-being and all of those things. But actually, those movements throughout the day are more, uh, more significant contributors to your overall energy expenditure. So we don't want to ignore those, and especially so many of us working remotely and at home. And now you might walk 10 feet to the bathroom instead of across the office and you're not walking into the building. And all of those things that added up before are now absent. So we, we definitely don't want to neglect that component. Yeah, no, yeah. It, it comes down to, for me, like 
intentionally parking further away from the entrance than I normally would. My instinct is park as close as possible. And now I'm like, I'm going to park a whole parking lot away and, you know, take the stairs sometimes instead of the elevator. And yeah, it's all of that stuff and even talk animatedly. But I do think a lot of that is occurring subconsciously and we can't always force us, you know, we can't think about every single, you'll go crazy trying to do that. And so, yeah. Um, how do you feel about liquid diets for obese people? Because I, I'll say this, the one kind of extreme diet I did when I was 550 pounds, I did a liquid diet for two months. I lost 80 pounds. And I will say, I never went back into that 80 pounds. The, you know, I got into the 400s and I never went above 500 again, which is something, um, you know, when my wife and her friends start throwing around the idea of dieting, that would be the absolute last thing I would ever suggest they do because they're all talking about losing. Like my mom, my wife will literally say to me, I need to lose five plus three pounds. And I'm like, why not just say eight? And she, she'll have this very bizarre reasoning about what five means and what three means. And I'm like, okay, you know, she doesn't, a liquid diet for her, I think is psychotic. But for somebody who's morbidly obese, what are your thoughts on a liquid diet? Well, it gets back to the discussion about what is your long-term goal? You're not going to sustain a liquid diet for very long. So it is not something I would recommend. Yes, you'll lose weight uh, in the short term, and then you'll gain it back uh, and, and potentially more. And so that's really destructive. So no, it's not something I recommend, though definitely many patients that I speak to have tried that along the way. Uh, the problem is that is a true crash diet. And so what's going to happen? Early on, you're going to deplete your glycogen. You're going to lose water weight. Okay, that's great. The scale is moving, uh, but then that's not going to continue. And so then the scale stops moving. And so you'll discontinue that diet path. So it's just not a long-term plan. So whether you call it a diet or whether it's a different treatment or medication, again, it gets to that long game. We have to really consider, is this something that you're going to sustain? Because that's really the changes we should be making. And so when you're doing the bariatric procedures, you, there, I, I mean, do those last forever? You stitch their stomach. Is that a permanent thing? Nothing's permanent in weight loss. That's a really key message that I tell every patient. You look at the most extreme surgeries, like a gastric bypass, still the king of weight loss treatments if you look at long-term weight loss, but it's not permanent. A large part of my practice is revising gastric bypass procedures that have been done years ago. So we know there's always the potential for weight recurrence. Uh, even if the stomach remains smaller, our bodies are really effective at adapting. And so you, you get used to that smaller stomach. Your stomach always has elasticity. You, you can eat more over time. So it gets to that foundation. We need to establish the portions, the habits along the way, make the most use of that tool, whatever it is, so that you're less reliant on the tool later on. Yeah, I talked to a guy who had, and I'm not sure which procedure, but one of those procedures lost a ton of weight, and then the weight started to creep back, and now he's on Wigovi. And, you know, I I don't know enough about it, but it, but it is one of those things where you, I think he was bummed because he thought, I'm going to have this procedure and I'm done. And then I had another guy on my show who had a procedure, and then a year later, they wanted to do another procedure on him. And he kind of fought tooth and nail to just maintain his weight, but, but it became a struggle after a year for him. He noticed like he had to make more choices. It wasn't just that he had to stop eating because his stomach was too small. He had to actively be making choices in this area. Definitely. And it, we have to be really upfront and transparent about that. There is no procedure, surgery, tool or anything else that will truly prevent you from overeating. Nothing will, at least not for long. And so we need to be really upfront about that. Um, this is a tool that will help, but it's not going to stop you from eating. So we have to work on establishing those habits, on retraining our bodies, our brains, our stomachs, on understanding what satisfaction is, not fullness, not capacity. We don't want to hit that capacity every time. So that is a learning process. But it's really important to understand that obesity itself is a condition. It is a disease. And I think we're making progress there in that message within uh, society and with, certainly within the medical world. 
but this is a chronic progressive and relapsing condition. So I would never tell a patient that any treatment is going to be the, the final definitive treatment. It's just not the truth. Yeah, no, no. And that, and that was one of the things, you, you know, I, I want to ask you about this. Um, and it's not, not something I have not experienced, but I, but I would love to know if there's science that says most people do or whatever. Um, so I forever tried, believed that, that I was treating an acute condition. I now, I now think of it as a chronic condition. Um, simply because after years of, you know, going like I'm sub 20% body fat, where's the magic? Where, when do I stop working? And, and I, and I've gotten much better at, like we talked about, like my goal is now the work, the work is my goal, not the outcome from the work, you, you know, like I don't, I, I would, in terms of like my job as an actor, when I've gone to do a movie simply for a paycheck, I've not felt great about the movie. But when I go to do the movie and and I love the movie and I love the part I'm playing and I get really into the work of it, the benefit of being paid for it is wonderful. And I experience that and I'm and I'm happy. So which thing are you going to focus on? For me, came is what it came down to. But as far as like, long-term weight loss and the body's desire to regain weight is there any science that suggests there is a time period where it gets easier and I, and, and to put to be completely fair i do f feel that my day to day day to day life today is easier than it was years ago i've i've structured it in a way where it's conducive for me to eat in the way that i want to eat to get enough rest you know there's lots of factors there i try to stay away from fast food and and when i say that i mean literally in the physical universe i try to avoid driving by fast food as much as possible i, I haven't eaten fast food in many years but i just don't want to smell it it makes me start thinking about it even billboards so i like try to avoid it as much as possible um but is there some science or or anything where you know, the, the human body after a certain amount, you, you know, you hear about these myths where it's like, if you maintain your weight loss for a year, your body won't want to regain the weight. I don't think that's true, but I'm asking if right. there's any, anything to support any of that. No, it's not true. Unfortunately, right. uh, our bodies are designed really for one thing, which is survival. And they're always going to try to promote weight, uh, when there's weight loss occurring. And so certain things will disrupt those processes. So medications, while you're on them, will disrupt those weight promoting processes. That's why they're effective. A procedure or surgery is also disrupting a lot of those hormonal processes that are underlying our, the constant uh, battle that it is against weight. Um, and so, no, it's not like those things expire after a period of time. That's why it is a chronic long-term condition. But that doesn't need to be... Uh, purely, you know, discouraging to people. It, it is about embracing that process, just like anything else. Um, once you can settle into that routine and really enjoy aspects of it or prove to yourself that you're succeeding, then it, then you can be more optimistic. But we have to be realistic that things will get in the way. There will be life events. You can veer off course. We just have to act and bring things back on the course because your body is there in the background trying to put that weight back on. It is. There's, there's almost no way around it. Yeah, I when I think about it in terms of like a movie, you know, where you could express all of your thoughts in a in a way that aren't totally realistic, but they're a good substitute for for realistic stuff. There are demons. There are both external and internal demons. There's what's going on in my head at all times, basically, which is like, remember how good lasagna is? And when you'd eat a whole plate of it, that's a thought that will just occur to me. You know, when you were five and your grandfather made the tray of lasagna and then they told you not to eat it, but they all left and you fucking went to town. That was fun. And then you laid on the couch and you experienced bliss from being so full of lasagna. Like that's a fucking thought that will just pop into my head with no prompting. And so there's those voices that say, like, don't get out of bed. Your phone has apps on it 
that any food you could imagine right now could be at your house in a half an hour. Another thought randomly just pops in my head. And then there's the external stuff where like I went to um, Best Buy to get new ear pods. And as I'm checking out, there's just like a plethora of food. And it's as though there, are, you know, in the in the movie version of this, there's a demon who's offering it up to me saying, take this, you know, and you're driving down the street and you're smelling French fries. Just the smell is being piped out of the restaurant into the street. And it's like luring you. And it's like a serpent that crawls up your nose and then drags you over to it. So there's like the, the those two kind of things that you're dealing with. And like, I don't want to make it too bleak, but it's fucking bleak. You know, there's a lot to, that, to deal with. Um, it's not all external. It's not all internal, but there's a balance. There's both things that are happening. Um, and I don't know that like, I don't know that either one is a hundred percent responsible for it, but like it, it, it right. is a lot to deal with, you know, and, and, and trying to communicate that to people of like, what was your motivation? It's like, motherfucker, I wanted to be thin since I was five years old. That's my motivation. My motivation is I want to feel normal. And guess what? I'm below 20% body fat. I still don't feel normal. So like, what the fuck are we even talking about here? Like, it's hard work no matter what. And all of the payoffs that I thought were coming never came. It's just still hard work. And it's going to be hard work forever. Yeah. That's true. And it is this combination of genetics and environment, and you can't ignore the environment component. Food is everywhere. Um, that makes it even more challenging. But you also have the genetics and the, the physiology underpinning all of this. An important thing for me as a physician, when I, when I first meet with a patient, most patients tell a similar story to me, which is, you know, I've tried this and this and this. I've been working at this for years and I'm failing. I failed. Everything I've done, I failed. And I hate that. And, and I really try to redirect that. You haven't felt, you've been working really hard at this. You're fighting a very uphill battle against the way your body is designed. And we need to acknowledge that. And now let's find some strategies that will actually help you succeed. But it's tough for patients who have been, for people who have been told their entire lives that this is a matter of willpower and you start to believe that and internalize it. And I do feel like one of my priorities is as often as I can to counter that message. No, actually, you've been working much harder at this than the individual who is not affected by obesity, much harder. And that person doesn't understand it. And uh, it's just so important to, to counter that message because everyone gets kind of caught in their heads and, and they're, it's, it's, they can come at, you know, to me depressed and feeling hopeless. And, and again, I want to bring it back to there is hope. You know, we do have treatments that work. Yeah. What are your thoughts on as far as the genetic component goes? Like, you know, this all does seem to be relatively new. So I don't think there's a real evolutionary piece because that takes a long time. But there could be like an epigenetic piece where like when I look at like the Dutch hunger winter and studies like that, where one generation to the next, the genes seem to have changed, which only tells me that they're there they maybe just got turned on where the prevalence for type 2 diabetes the prevalence for obesity can skyrocket with any sort of famine experienced by the parents especially if the parents are, or if the mother is pregnant at the time of famine with the child and and that just makes me wonder if you think that the actual culprit here is maybe diet culture it's such a complex question, and I don't believe we have all the answers. If you, There is a genetic component to this. We know that. And the estimates are somewhere between 30 and 70% of obesity is related to genetics. That is definitely a factor, but you're right. We haven't evolved between the 1950s and 1970s. We did not evolve as a species. It didn't happen. What did change? Well, the environment changed. And like many things, it's, it takes more than one hit. It's a two hit process at minimum. And so you take the genetic propensity to gain weight or to hold on to weight more easily and then combine that with an environment that facilitates that. And then you can end up with obesity. So those are two really important factors. And then you add in all of the other things, the diet culture and 
and, and everything else that, that, that occurs in society. And then, then you end up where we are, which is the, the obesity rates that are, are well established. Right. Yeah. I, I think it, it probably is that perfect storm. We have these genetics. We then have, a, 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 for the first time in the history of mankind, just an insane abundance of food. We have suddenly a weight starts ticking up. Then you have the the antidote, the seeming antidote to that, which was all the insane diets that our parents did. And 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 I think we it just started turning this on more and more. And suddenly it's like, well, now you've got the populace basically for the most part or the majority is now overweight. Right. I think it's I think we've tipped that scale. Um, right. But which it's is important scary. not to ignore the genetic components. And um, that's important for people to understand, because some of this is difficult to overcome. Uh, even if you eliminate that those environment cues and and it, it's just more than willpower. It's such an important message for people to understand. Uh, this is a true condition, and uh, you can't necessarily will it away. Just like you can't will your blood pressure down in most cases, and so that's how we have to approach this condition. Yeah, it is. It is very helpful for me to think about it that way. That my body and I, if we can separate them for this purposes of this conversation, want different things. And if I understand what my body is trying to accomplish, I can cut it a little slack. You know, my body is thinking of fat as the way I think of my savings account, you know, in a bank. And, and I can't fault it for that. I can't say you're wrong. I understand where that like that comes from at some point in my genetic line. Somebody starved to death and enough people starved to death that the body said, hey, how do we protect against this? And that, you know, here's how we do it. When there's lots of food, we eat lots of food. Um, yeah, it, it makes it easier for me to fight against it. I think it's helpful to understand those mechanisms and the, the knowledge can be empowering to understand why that diet is not sustainable. Well, because as you're cutting calories, your body is, view, as you're losing weight, your body is viewing that as problematic. It doesn't know you're trying to lose the weight. And then all of these pathways kick into action and ghrelin starts rising and you're hungrier. And how are you going to fight that through willpower? It's really challenging. And so it is important to know that. And I think that education component is, is really useful for people to understand. No, it's not that you just gave up or lost the willpower. Uh, actually, all of these things were happening to try to stop you from dieting. Do you, with, with your patients, do you have uh, maintenance periods built into diets? Like, let's say a guy says he wants to be 150 pounds, he's 350 pounds. Would you put him have him intentionally not lose weight for periods of time before he gets to whatever goal he set for himself? Not necessarily. What we will do though, is we will update the nutrition plan uh, over time as weight loss is occurring. We want to continue to reevaluate the basal metabolic rate and, and activity levels and adjust the, the nutrition plan. But none of this is, is made to be drastic. Um, this is all just consistency over time. Most patients are surprised at how much they are able to eat or you know, allowed to eat uh, in this process. We, we want this to be manageable long term. And it takes a year to year and a half to lose the amount of weight that you'll lose with a procedure like this or even with the newer medications. That's how long it takes. So we want to keep that view of a year plus time period and nothing drastic along the way. And we're just chipping away at things month after month. But that's where that accountability is really important as well. You, know, you need to work with the team follow up um, so we can both be held accountable. Oh, well, I will say just, and again, anecdotal, but just to put it in your head, my experience was because at some point maintenance is forever, right? Whatever your goal is, the idea of long-term sustainability is maintenance for the rest of your life, right? That's when I, the last time I was on a long-term diet, by breaking it up into blocks of maintenance periods that were prior to my goal, it really set a foundation for me that when I got to the long-term maintenance area, I, I'd already understood it and I already had worked at it. I, I will say at the same time, 
those months where I was maintaining prior to reaching my goal were the absolute hardest diets I've ever done because I would get on the scale a few times a week and be devastated at no change. I'm still devastated. I'm maintaining my weight right now and still devastated every time I get on the scale. And it's not just miraculously gone down. And I know if it does miraculously gone down, I didn't eat a lot of salt the day before. It's pretty much that simple. But like, it's it, it, it kind of set me up in a good way to talk myself through that you know, when I got to the place of like, okay, I guess this yeah. is my weight that I'm going to maintain for a long time, having practiced doing it at 300 pounds and 350 pounds, um, where it was like, okay, now I'm not losing weight. How do I eat? How do I, I got to learn how to do this. It was easier, I think, than just dieting straight through and then getting to a point where it's like, well, now you're on maintenance and now you're going to learn how to do it. That's just my two cents. I have no other data to support that that's going to be successful for anybody, but it, it was helpful for me. But, you know, that's an interesting perspective. Yeah. Well, a big part of this is learning along the way. Um, and, and, and we have to do that, but also acknowledging that weight loss is not linear and it's far from it. And there will be periods of time where the scale will not move for weeks, sometimes months, awesome. despite doing what you, it's awful. And so our general advice is just tuck that scale away. Uh, if you're, if you're, you know, adhering to the plan, uh, we always say, trust the process uh, and, and let us, you know, trust us and just stop weighing yourself. There are times where you have to put that scale away. It is so destructive. Yeah, no, no, I totally agree. I think for people that it really screws with, like if you have to use metrics, use a tape measure or how your clothes are fitting or whatever it is, but the scale can be, you know, it's just like this angry little machine that, that makes you feel like not a person every day. You know, it's a terrible yeah. thing sometimes. And then for other people, it's like, no, it's a metric that is not screwing me up too much. I've gotten to the place where I have to have a conversation with myself pretty much every time I get on the scale, but it's a conversation that I have. And then it, you know, it takes four seconds and then I'm done. Yeah. It's, it, it's important to have a healthy relationship with the scale and not everyone can establish that, but it's the number that we're all used to. That's how we judge weight loss. That's how that's, that's the number, but it is so limited in the information it provides. And especially someone who starts adding in strength training and resistance and exercise and, and even telling every patient, the scale is not going to move for a while. You're going to be changing body composition. And if we can measure that, great. If you can do the DEXA scans like you've done, if you can just measure with tape measures, great. We need to track those things because that scale is not moving, but there's major changes occurring and you need to recognize those. That's amazing. Doc, this has been a great conversation. I think you're awesome. Thank you very much. Thanks so much for having me. This has been great.